So today we'll consider the meaning of density of states and how to express the density of states uh, in phase space and also in the energy space. We'll consider that in the today's class. So basically density of states is defined in the phase space initially, then we can express that a density of state in the energy coordinate. So if you consider the phase space corresponding to a system with the F degrees of freedom, the system has F degrees of freedom that is represented in phase space, then we need F number of position coordinates and F number of momentum coordinates okay, to represent that system, dynamic system. Okay. So let us take Q1, Q2, Q3, so on up to QF are the position coordinates. P1, P2, P3, so on up to PF are the momentum coordinates of the system at a particular instant of time. Then phase space can be divided into large number of cells called phase cells. And volume of that phase cell is given by this particular Term, that is dq1 into dq2 into dq3 so on up to dqf into dp1 into dp2 into dp3 so on up to dpf. So these are the, the smallest part of the coordinates in the phase space. So that phase space is <coughs> subdivided into large number of phase cells and each phase cell is having the volume equal to this term. We know that this phase space is 2f dimensional space, if f is the degrees of freedom of the system. While studying phase space, we have studied that. Next, if this is the volume, the total volume of the phase space is equal to integration of volume of each phase cell. So you have to integrate over all the phase cells to get the total volume of the phase space corresponding to a system. That means you the volume of the system, total volume of the system. And that is given by V is equal to integration, which is running from minus infinity to infinity. So you have to integrate it total two F times. So you have to integrate this with respect to F, two F number of variables, dq1, dq2, dq3, so on up to dqf into dp1, dp2, dp3, so on up to dpf. So this integration should be done for 2f number of times, where this term integrand is representing volume of a single phase cell. The integration of this volume gives you total volume of the phase space. Okay. Now you collect the term dq and dp, dq1 into dp1. Similarly, you collect the terms containing dq2 and dp2. So like that, if you collect, then you will get a dimension of this dq into dp is the same as the dimension of angular momentum. And for a system with f degrees of freedom, the dimensions of the integrand of the above equation will be dq into dp to the power f. If you take the only dimension, then dimension of this volume of the phase cell is equal to dq into dp to the power f. So there will be f number of position coordinates, f number of q coordinates, f number of p coordinates. Because of that, you will get a total 2f number of coordinates. If you collect the terms containing q1, p1 together, you will get dq into dp to the power f. That will be the dimension of this phase cell. Okay. Otherwise, this integrand will have the dimension dq into dp to the power f. Okay where this dq into dp, it is nothing but position into momentum. So it is of the form some r cross p, r into p. That's why this represents the dimension of angular momentum. We know that angular momentum is r cross p, where r is the position vector, p is the linear momentum. If you take the product of position and momentum, linear momentum, that will give you the angular momentum. That's why the dimension of the integrand is basically equal to dq into dp to the power f. So this can be replaced by its dimension. So here we consider this dq into dp is equal to h, which is a constant with the dimensions of angular momentum. For a given coordinate, 
this product is going to be constant in accordance with the conservation of angular momentum this dq into dp equal to h and in accordance with quantum mechanics also this angular momentum is going to be conserved and it is going to be quantized okay if you go to the quantum mechanical treatment this h will be planck's constant but in classical physics we'll consider this product of dq and dp is equal to some constant h if you go to the quantum mechanical treatment then definitely this h is planck's constant there here we'll consider h is a, an arbitrary constant okay which is for the dimension of angular momentum so therefore i can find out the volume of each phase cell as h to the power f okay so it is product of dq1 dq2 so on up to dp dqf into dp1 so on up to dpf so if you collect the terms containing dq1 into dp1 dq2 into dp2 like that if you do you will get total f number of such terms so therefore volume of each phase cell is equal to h to the power f where h is some arbitrary constant which is having the uh, dimension of angular momentum suppose each phase cell is considered as a single state single state of the system then the number of states of the system possible states of the system is given by g is equal to volume of phase space total volume of the phase space divided by volume of the phase cell okay that will give you total number of cells present in the phase space so what do you mean by the number of states in the system it is nothing but total number of phase cells because each phase cell represents a one state one single state and represent matter that's why what are the total number of cells if you want to find out then it will be the ratio of volume of the total phase space divided by volume of a single phase cell okay so it is nothing but dividing the total volume by smaller volumes so how many cells you can get that is nothing but the number of states available so basically this is called as the density of states it's okay, the density of states and that okay so basically the, the density of states is defined as volume of the total phase space divided by volume of a single phase cell that is given by v divided by h to the power f where f is the degrees of freedom of the system suppose we consider the phase space as a momentum space suppose only momentum is considered the three dimensional momentum space if you consider okay then volume of the phase cell is given by the volume enclosed between two concentric spheres of radii p and p plus dp that volume of that sphere the hollow sphere is going to be 4 pi p square into dp that is representing one phase cell so suppose you <coughs> convert that entire sphere solid sphere into large number of hollow spheres then each hollow sphere will have the volume equal to 4 pi p square into dp what is that 4 pi p square that is representing the surface area of the sphere into thickness of that hollow sphere so that will give you 4 pi p square into dp that is the volume of one phase cell such a phase cells has to be considered <coughs> repeatedly large number of the, those phase cells are constituting the phase space then what will be the <coughs> uh, density of state that is equal to volume of the phase space divided by volume of each cell so that is given by gp into dp that is equal to total volume divided by h cube into volume of a sim single phase cell okay so volume of the phase cell is 4 pi p square into dp so just you have to convert you have to multiply this dp okay so that is how you can get the density of state in three dimensional momentum space here h cube appears because it is a three dimensional space it is a momentum space that's why you will get v divided by h cube into 4 pi square by p square into dp that is the density of state in momentum space similarly you can find the density of states in energy space how to do that you convert this p in terms of energy how to convert this p into energy 
So you know that energy equal to P square by 2m. Therefore, P equal to square root of 2me. We know that P square equal to 2me. That is E equal to P square by 2m. Therefore, P square equal to 2me. Okay, where m is the mass of the particle, E is the energy. Differentiate this equation, you will get 2p into dp is equal to 2m into d, where m is constant. So derivative of p square is 2p into dp is equal to derivative of e is de. 2, 2 gets cancelled, you will get dp is equal to m de divided by square root of 2me, because we know that p is equal to square root of 2me. Substitute for p and dp here. So for p, we have to substitute p square. It is a 4 pi p square into dp. p square is replaced by 2me and dp is equal to mde divided by square root of 2me. Okay, if you substitute that and if you simplify it further, you will get g of e into de is equal to 4 pi mv divided by h cube into 2me to the power half into de. Okay, so here, m 4 pi they are collected in the numerator here and square root of 2 m e here and 2 m e so 2 m e divided by square root of 2 m e is square root of 2 m e so that is written as 2 m e to the power half so this is the density of state expressed in energy space so that is how you can express the density of state in any phase space with different coordinates okay here i have represented the density of states in momentum coordinate and energy coordinate in general the density of state is given by v divided by h to the power f where h is having the uh, dimension of the angular momentum okay just you remember this is necessary to understand the application of maxwell boltzmann distribution function so just you remember this concept so this is, I have not discussed the derivation, just I have discussed the final result. Okay. So just you remember the final result of the density of state in momentum space and energy space. Okay. We'll move further. Let us take the Stirling approximation. Next part is Stirling approximation or Stirling's formula. So this is, one minute. So Stirling approximation basically gives the approximation for ln of n factorial. Okay. So Stirling approximation statement says that it is an analytical approximation for factorial of very large number. And the statement of Stirling approximation is ln of n factorial is equal to n ln n minus n. So approximately, if you take ln of n factorial that will be nearly equal to n ln n minus n okay where n is very very large so this holds good for very large value of n so the proof is very simple we'll try to prove this ln n factorial is equal to n ln n minus n ln means it is log to the base e ln is it's a logarithm to the base e okay that is represented as ln let us take the proof. So let us uh, start with the n factorial. Okay, left hand side we will consider. So first we will consider the n factorial. So factorial of n is nothing but product of all the integers up to n. Okay, so that is equal to 1 into 2 into 3, so on up to n minus 2 into n minus 1 into n. Okay, you have to take product of all the integers starting from 1 to n. So that is called as n factorial. Take ln on both sides. Okay. So taking ln on both sides, you will get ln of n factorial is equal to ln of 1 into 2 into 3, so on up to n. So you know that log of product of numbers, ln of m into n into l, if, you, if it runs like that, then ln of product of numbers is equal to ln of sum of ln of each numbers. So that can be rewritten as ln of n factorial equal to ln of 1 plus ln of 2 plus ln of 3 so on up to ln of n. Okay. So next step, what you have to do? You convert this as a summation. Okay. 
So right hand side is a summation of ln of n, okay, where n runs from 1 to n. So right hand side is written as summation of ln of n because it is ln of 1 plus ln of 2 plus ln of 3 so on up to ln of n. Therefore, this right hand side is rewritten as the summation of ln of n. Next step, what you have to do? The summation can be represented as an integration because n is very, very large. Okay. Therefore, the term values in that summation are very small. You can write that summation as an integration. Integration is nothing but the summation only, but it takes the summation by parts. Okay. Part, part, agi summation also. That's why that summation can be written in terms of the integration. That is integration of ln n into dn, where n runs from 1 to n. The limits of integration are 1 to n. So it is nearly equal to integration of ln n. Okay, that's why it is called as approximation. So how to take integration of this particular integral? Okay, you have to use the integration by parts technique. So multiply this term by 1. Okay, one and a multiply matter. You multiply it by one. Okay. So then you consider this as a first function, this as a second function. Okay. First function into second function. Integration by parts you have to do. So integration by parts says that it is equal to first function into integral of the second. Integration of one is n and limits are one to n minus integration of derivative of the first function into integration of the second function. Derivative of ln n is 1 by n into uh, integration of 1 is n. Okay. So here it becomes integration of 1, it becomes n. So put the first function and second function here. The lower limit is 1. Ln of 1 is 0. Okay. You know that ln of 1 is 0. Ln n you substitute here, you will get n into ln n. And here, here you will get the integration of 1 equal to n. If you put the lower limit and upper limit, it will become n minus 1. So integration of this one will be n minus 1. Open the bracket, you will get n ln n minus n plus 1. Compared to the value of n, 1 is very, very small because we have to consider the large value of n. Therefore, this 1 can be neglected. Therefore, you can write, since n is very, very larger compared to 1, ln of n factorial will be n ln n minus n. Okay, this is known as Stirling's formula or Stirling approximation and is very important in statistical mechanics that deals with very large number of microstates. In the derivation of maxwell boltzmann distribution, you know, Fermi-Dirac distribution, Everywhere you are going to use the Stirling approximation. What it says? It says that ln of n factorial is approximately equal to n ln n minus n. This is called as Stirling approximation. So derivation is for your knowledge. It is not included in the syllabus. Just it is for your knowledge. Next last part we'll consider that is relation between entropy and probability. That is called as Boltzmann theorem. Basically, this Boltzmann's theorem gives you the relation between entropy and the thermodynamic probability. Our relation is okay. the So, according to Boltzmann's explanation of a physical system, a system left to itself attains a state of maximum entropy and state of maximum probability. So, if you leave a system for a long time, the system will attain the maximum entropy. Entropy of the system continuously increases. Okay. The disorderness of the system continuously increases. It decays. And also, it goes to the maximum probability. What do you mean by maximum probability? It can be found in different states. Okay. Minimum probability means the completely ordered state. Although one day perfect state is the maximum probability means the System can be found in <coughs> many states, different states. Okay. Therefore, the entropy S of the system must be some function of probability. Okay. So it says that the entropy of the system 
must be related to probability because it is observed that when entropy increases the thermodynamic probability also increases because of that entropy is a function of the thermodynamic probability okay so let us prove how this esc is related to thermodynamic probability for that let us consider two independent systems system 1 and system 2 they are having the entropies let us take s1 and s2 let omega 1 and omega 2 be the probabilities of system with these entropies respectively where omega 1 is the entropy of uh, sorry uh, thermodynamic probability of system 1 omega 2 is the thermodynamic probability of system 2 s1 is the entropy of system 1 s2 is the entropy of system 2 their individual quantities if a system is combined if these two systems are combined then entropy becomes additive the total entropy of the system will be equal to s1 plus s2 but the probability will be omega 1 into omega 2 that is in accordance with the the multiple probability function okay so since they are independent systems the thermodynamic probability will be independent because of that the total probability of the combined system will be omega 1 into omega 2 now you find out what will be the entropy and thermodynamic probability relation for this combined system for a combined system the entropy is additive and the probability is multiplicative therefore the total entropy of the combined system will be equal to s1 plus s2 which is equal to a function of omega 1 into omega 2 because you know that entropy is a function of probability okay now you substitute for this s1 and s2 individually we know that s1 is a function of omega 1 s2 is a function of omega 2 this is for system 1 this is for system 2 therefore substitute here you will get f of omega 1 plus f of omega 2 which is equal to f of omega 1 into omega 2 okay now you differentiate this equation partially with respect to omega 1 and omega 2 separately first you differentiate this equation uh, with respect to omega 1 partially where omega 2 is independent variable and it is considered as constant differentiating partially with respect to omega 1 and omega 2 separately first you differentiate with respect to omega 1 that will give you derivative of f of omega 1 is equal to omega 2 is constant since you are differentiating partially so omega 2 into dou of f of omega 1 into omega 2 f omega 2 is taken out since it is a constant we are differentiating it partially next step you differentiate this equation with respect to omega 2 by considering omega 1 constant therefore you will get derivative of f of omega 2 is equal to <coughs> omega 1 into derivative of f of omega 1 into omega 2. Now we have to make this right hand side equal. You look at the right hand side of this equation and second equation. Here it is omega 2 into derivative of f of omega 1 into omega 2. Here it is omega 1 into derivative of f of omega 1 into omega 2. So derivative of f of omega 1 into omega 2 is a common factor. Here it is omega 2, here it is omega 1. So what you can do? To make this right hand side equal, you multiply this equation 1 by omega 1, multiply the second equation by omega 2. Okay. So, by doing that, you will get the first equation as omega 1 into derivative of f of omega 1 is equal to omega 1 into omega 2 into derivative of this function. Multiply the second equation by omega 2, you will get omega 2 into derivative of f of omega 2 is equal to omega 1 into omega 2 into derivative of this function. Look at the right hand sides. They are equal. They are equal. Therefore, left hand sides must be equal. And we know that omega 1 and omega 2 are independent. Okay. They are independent functions. Therefore, you will get the omega 1 into derivative of f of omega 1 should be equal to omega 2 into derivative of f of omega 2. That is, should be constant because omega 1 and omega 2 are independent. So, then definitely this product must be constant. And this applies to all the systems. It is system 1, system 2, 
if you take system 3 4 etc then this equation holds good for all the system therefore in the general you can write in the general the thermodynamic probability omega into derivative of function of omega should be a constant for any system that is the general statement you will get that omega into d of f of omega should be equal to some constant k1 let us take finally we have to integrate this equation and find the relation between s and omega finally we have got this equation omega into derivative of f of omega equal to k1 which is a constant now i can <coughs> rearrange this this is a derivative of f of omega means it is d by d omega this is with respect to omega therefore derivative of f of omega can be written as k1 into d omega by omega i will take this omega to the other side d by d omega anta bartade ee d omega na ilta hotu now this is a first order differential equation with separated variables integrate it if you integrate this integration of derivative of f of omega is f of omega is equal to k1 into ln omega because integration of 1 by omega is ln omega okay integration of 1 by omega is ln omega okay plus some integration constant okay and here k1 is a constant and k2 is a integration constant k2 is a integration constant one second okay now to find the values of k1 and k2 before that what you can do you know that the function of omega is a entropy we know that s is a function of omega therefore i can replace this left hand side by entropy s therefore you will get entropy s is equal to k1 ln omega plus k2 so this is the relation between entropy s and omega but we sh we, we should calculate the values of k1 and k2 now that is remaining okay to find the value of k2 you consider the case at 0 kelvin the relation has general validity this particular relation has general validity it is applicable to a perfect crystal at 0 kelvin consider the case at t equal to 0 kelvin according to third law of thermodynamics at 0 kelvin the entropy of the system is zero what do you mean by entropy of the system is zero the system is in the perfectly ordered state okay at t equal to zero the crystal is perfect crystal is perfect means there is only one possible state for that perfect state matter so it can be found in very ordered state then for the probability is equal to one for that state only no other states are possible only perfect state is possible at t equal to zero so at a temperature t equal to zero entropy is zero that means the crystal is perfect therefore there is only one state possible for it that is the perfect state therefore probability of that state is 100 percent that is omega equal to one only one state is possible therefore at a t equal to zero entropy is zero and omega is equal to one what is ln of one ln of one is zero therefore s is zero second term is zero k2 must be equal to zero therefore k2 is a zero therefore you will get the entropy s is equal to k1 into ln omega and finally we have to find what is the value of k1 let us do that it can be proved that k1 is equal to r by n a you can prove this constant k1 is a boltzmann constant and it is having the value k is equal to 1.38 into 10 to the power minus 23 joule per kelvin and basically the boltzmann constant is ratio of gas constant to the avogadro number r is gas constant n a is avogadro number therefore the constant k1 in the above equation is a boltzmann constant and finally the entropy probability relation becomes equal to s equal to k ln omega where k is the boltzmann constant omega is the thermodynamic probability okay and this relation connecting the entropy of the system with its probability is called as the boltzmann's theorem okay boltzmann's theorem this is the proof for boltzmann's theorem this is very very important so it says that entropy of the system yes is equal to k into ln omega where k is the boltzmann constant omega is the 
thermodynamic probability. And you should remember one important point here that the change in entropy is zero when the omega, that is ds, is zero means it is attaining the maximum entropy. Maximum entropy is observed for the system which is left for long time. Okay, so you remember that. So if change in entropy is zero, then derivative of ln omega must be equal to zero. That is the concept here. Okay, derivative of ln omega equal to zero represents the maximum probability. Okay, most probable state of the system can be found by taking the derivative of this particular equation. That is the significance of the Boltzmann's equation.